When you talk about the West, if you understand yourself as bearers of that tradition, we don't have the right to despair, we have a job to do, and that is to seek the good, the true, and the beautiful, and to leave the rest to God. Hey, it's Andrew Clavin. Many people ask me, are you related to Spencer Clavin? And no, I'm not. Uh, but uh, he has written a terrific book. He spells his name the same way, oddly enough, called How to Save the West, Ancient Wisdom for Five Modern Crises. This is the second of our three conversations about this book, so you might want to check out the first as well. We sort of ended in the last one talking a little bit about the, the body and the body crisis and, and transgenderism and people changing gender. And it, it seems like it came out of nowhere and yeah. spread like wildfire. Uh, and it has this feeling like nobody's ever thought of this before. Is there ancient wisdom to speak into this gender, weird gender dysmorphia that seems to have infected the entire country? Yeah, I think you put that really well. It, and I hear this all the time. It's like, this just came out of nowhere. Yeah. Suddenly, you know, it's like in 2020 or 2016 or whatever date you want to pick that's like exploded. And if you look at the statistics on this stuff, it actually has gone up. There has been a, an uptick in gender dysphoria. In part, I argue in the book, um, because we're teaching kids that their bodies are kind of malleable, that their gender is, is, a, is a construct. Um, but one of the things that I argue is that fundamentally, as a, uh, as a crisis, the problem of, of the body, of the human body, it's actually very old. And it's really hard. It's hard to live in a body. Yeah. Um, and this is something I think we can understand and have a little bit of compassion for, you know, since forever, basically, um, we've known that there is something more to us than our flesh. We're not just chemistry sets in meat sacks. We're not just bone mechs piloting meat armor or however you want to put it, right? There is something more to us than that. And in fact, all of the things that matter most about us live in that something more kind of space. Uh, beauty, truth, love, memory, virtue, right? These are things that don't actually exist anywhere on a brain scan. And now there's this kind of cheap modern wisdom, this idea that, you know, actually you do boil down to what you can find on a brain scan and everything else is just kind of accidental. It's just a kind of, um, you know, a, a byproduct of your evolution or your biology that you have these feelings inside. You're, what you really are is a machine. And of course we know that's not true. In fact, we know urgently that the things you can't map on a machine are the realest things about us. And so the problem is not, well, why do we have these kind of accidental feelings of love and desire and joy? Um, the problem is, why do we have to have this flesh? Why do we have to have a body sitting around? Because the body causes all sorts of problems. It decays, it breaks down, it eventually dies. This is, you know, a terrible tragedy. And ever since people have thought about this stuff, there has been the temptation to transcend or get rid of the body. Um, I talk in the book about Plotinus, who is a philosopher who followed the Greek philosopher Plato. And really his biographer, his ancient biographer says that he seemed ashamed of being in his body. He wouldn't go to the public baths. Um, when he got sick as an old man, he wouldn't take the required medicine because it was too physical, essentially. Um, and he just thought that he was gonna kind of transcend out of his flesh and become a divine spark. Um, and so th what this shows us is that there's something very kind of deep in this, in this longing um, that has now been reanimated, I think, by digital technology. Now that we have this tech, we can, you know, put ourselves on screens. We sort of see one another through screens. We start to think again, well, maybe, maybe we can get past this, you know, flesh that, that we are. And, and this is, I think, where this crisis comes from. You could say, why have we suddenly started feeling all of this, like, transgenderism, dysphoria stuff? It's because we are now being forced back again into this body crisis, into this kind of hatred of the flesh, this desire to reform it and change it according to some sort of spirit or gender identity, right, whatever. Um, and, and basically what I'm proposing here is that this is, uh, is never a successful proposition, that even though the tech is new, the offer is old and it's mm -hmm. always a bad deal. Um, and, and I think that, you know, ultimately people are starting to kind of have an intuition of this and it can be reinforced by these ancient texts, uncovering the, the reality that what you actually are is an embodied soul. You're actually uh, what 
Aristotle uh, or Aristotelians might call a hylomorphic entity. You are form, morphe, in matter, hule. Mm -hmm. um, and there is no such thing as being born in the wrong body. Um, there's the, you are eff effectively uh, a, a union of, of body and soul. And understanding yourself that way is a path to much deeper happiness than all the other stuff they're, they're offering you. Like so many other things now, everything seems to get back to sex. Everything seems yeah. to center around sex. Yeah, yeah. And you think of, um, you know, the the Bible saying, well, man was ma made in God's image, male and female. Mm. And then you think of Jesus saying there's no marriage in heaven, which raises the question of like, are we still mm. uh, male and female? Was was this a question that the ancients actually worried about, or was this, is this something that we just made up uh, whole, whole cloth? <laughs> no, no. There are uh, you can find in, in patristic literature in the early church fathers you can find speculation about whether we'll all be male at the resurrection, whether there is some kind of whether whether we're leaving sex behind because we have you know souls because we are more than than our bodies. There's always been this kind of curiosity about what the resurrected state will, will be like. And, and that has something to do with, you know, moving beyond the, the present state, which is which is fallen. Um, but one of the things I point out in, in the book is that that passage from, from Genesis and that creation story, um, when God breathes life into the dust, when he creates man, Adam, it's not actually that he takes like some essential mankind, which is this pure breath and spirit, and he fuses it with this kind of useless clay. Mm -hmm. um, instead, what the text says is, you know, God breathed the breath of life into the dust, and then it became a living soul. It's the mm -hmm. fusion of the spirit and the flesh that actually makes us what we are. And, you know, I, I think that you really can't talk or think about this stuff without uh, observing that the hatred of, of womanhood, of, of femaleness that comes along with a lot of the desire to transcend our, our bodies. And so I think that actually, uh, you know, sex in the sense of, the, of what people now call gender, you know, that is, that is uh, womanhood is really urgently important here. And that's because women in their role as the bearers of children are like a little, you know, portrait, a picture of this truth. They bear witness to the fact that our flesh is actually the medium of life. It is the thing in which even God himself consents to come into being. It's incredibly profound, and it's why whenever they start to try to break this down, they reduce women to their body parts and act as if men can just basically put on womanhood like a sort of skin suit, you know, the menstruators, chest feeders, all this language that we use. Um, you will start to understand that what that is is an attempt to deny the fact that, that women make so apparent with their, uh, with, with their essential natures, which is that our flesh is, is something much more than just a kind of you know, accident that we can rearrange. Is there some reason, I mean, obviously our technology has blown up in just in the last 50 years. Yeah. Blown up, and it, it is more uh, possible to carve somebody into the uh, represented, physical representation of the sex he wants to be uh, than it was. The, are these, are the ancients, talking about the ancients of Greece, maybe mm -hmm. the ancients of Israel, are they still relevant to this question? I mean, do they have, is there a reason why we should turn to them instead of the guy next to us? Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I think that what you're observing is what the ancients would have called a development, a, a, an advanced development of techne. Um, and this is, a, you know, where we get our word technological from. It's, it's like a kind of um, a power that you have over the material of, of nature. It's, it's not the same thing as, as absolute scientific knowledge, episteme, um, which is kind of like the knowledge of, of the, the real very the truths of you know virtue and and, and goodness. Um, this is like a kind of technical knowledge. We know how to do more stuff. Uh, you know, uh, you and I will both live to see. I assume you're about to keel over in about five minutes, but you, you and I will both live to see this technology get more and more. Uh, advanced. Really? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we better kind of. Uh, um, no, I mean, this stuff is going to get more and, and more advanced, yeah. and you're going to see people argue. You know, it's not just about sex and gender. You're going to see people argue that we should turn ourselves into robots. You're already seeing people say, well, I'm, I identify as a dog, I identify as a demon, whatever. Um, and, and, and this tech, as it gets more advanced, it gets easier and easier to confuse it for the real thing. But that's precisely why we need these first principle questions that guys like Aristotle and the ancients raised. Because if tech enables us to do anything, to make ourselves even into anything, 
suddenly it becomes a really urgent question, what should we do? Mm. What should we make ourselves into, right? And that, that ought question, the question of morality and, and, and goodness, um, those are the questions that don't go away, that have been there since antiquity um, and, and are going to become really crucial to ask and answer as this tech gets more advanced. That's a, a great answer. Oh, thank you. Who is this guy? <laughs> so, oh, Spencer Clavin. I so, says right there. I considered uh, spelling it with an E. <laughs> to <disassociate laughs> to, yeah. I, yeah, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have blamed you. Uh, the book is How to Save the West, Ancient Wisdom for Five Modern Crises. Uh, it is not actually that big. It's more like this size, but you can get it now uh, on, on wherever you get your books, Amazon, wherever you get your books. And you should. We're going to do one more of these because there's still more to talk about. 